In this video, we're finally going to learn how to interpret a proton NMR spectrum, integrating all the knowledge we've developed over this unit about how NMR works and what we can pull from proton NMR spectra. The first thing I want to say is something that I said back when we talked about infrared spectroscopy and mass spec and interpreting those spectra. It's very important here to stay flexible when you're in the midst of the problem solving process. You're going to go down tons of dead ends. It's going to be very important to go down a road, realize you've hit a dead end, back up, and try to find another pathway toward the most reasonable structure given all of the experimental data you're presented with. So staying mentally flexible is really important. And there's an element of literal mental stamina to solving spectroscopy problems where after you've gone down one, two, three dead ends, you need to be able to dust yourself off and try something else. And sometimes this is very difficult. Make no mistake, solving spectroscopy problems can be very difficult. But we get so, so much information from proton NMR that it is one technique that you can really, really use as the most powerful technique. It's one place that you can look, for example, first thing or in the early stages of solving a structure to get a lot of information out very early. The first thing, though, I think you should do when analyzing a proton NMR spectrum is look at the molecular formula and calculate HDI. This will generally be provided because it comes from elemental analysis, which is another analytical technique that can tell you the molecular formula. We can potentially get some clues about functional groups from the HDI. For example, with a very low number of hydrogens with a lot of unsaturation, often aromatic rings are involved. Then I would encourage you to look at the number of signals and the integrations. And we did this previously when we were generating NMR spectra, educated guesses of NMR spectra from a molecular structure. Consider the number of signals that you see and their integrations, particularly with respect to the molecular formula. Make sure the integrations match up with the total number of hydrogens in the compound. And if they don't, you're probably looking at a symmetry situation. Then analyze each signal and try to use coupling and splitting patterns to draw fragment structures associated with each signal or multiple signals. What we're going to do is join those fragments to construct the full molecular structure. And the next step then is to assemble that full molecular structure by joining the fragments. And here coupling is key. You want to make sure that when you join fragments together, any coupling you introduce is accounted for in the splitting patterns in the signals in the proton NMR spectrum. And then last but certainly not least, and very important step here after assembling the fragments is to do a sanity check. Review your structure against all of the experimental data you have. The molecular formula, does it have the right number of hydrogens is an important sanity check. The proton NMR spectrum all of the signals, all of the signals, all of the splitting patterns should be consistent with your proposed molecular structure. And if this doesn't happen, stay flexible. If th this doesn't happen, return to step three or step two and just iterate, right? And eventually you'll reach a point where you have a structure that is consistent with the proton NMR spectrum. All right, let's put our money where our mouth is now and solve the structure of this compound from its proton NMR spectrum. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do here is look at the molecular formula, C7H14O. What is the hydrogen deficiency index associated with this molecular formula? Well, C7 as a fully saturated alkane, for example, would be H16, and I've got 14 hydrogens in this compound. The oxygen is irrelevant, so I have one degree of unsaturation here, or an HDI equal to 1. All right, excellent. Integrations. Let's look at integrations next. I have 10.8 for this signal on the left and 65.7 for this signal on the right. Let's divide both of these by the smaller of those two values. 10.8 divided by 10.8 is obviously going to come out to 1 one hydrogen. Actually, I'm just going to leave that as a one for the time being. And 65.7 divided by 10.8. If my math skills serve me right here, that's going to be roughly speaking six. Now, if we compare these lowest whole number integrations to the molecular formula, we'll notice something interesting. One plus six is seven, but there are 14 hydrogens in the molecular formula, 14 hydrogens in the molecule. This means that the true integrations, the true numbers of hydrogens that these signals correspond to, 
are 2 for this signal and 12 for this signal. We need to scale up to account for all the hydrogens in the molecular formula. All righty. So we've got the number of signals. We've got two distinct types of protons in this compound. We've likely got symmetry, right? We've likely got symmetry here with two hydrogens and 12 hydrogens. One way we can tell we have symmetry is this is a doublet, right? Meaning these protons have one neighbor, but this signal integrates to two. So it, it seems like we have two groups where we have one hydrogen adjacent to six hydrogens appearing twice in the molecular structure. How can we achieve this? Well, let's roll the clock back to our common splitting patterns. I'm actually going to go back to that slide where we looked at the co some common splitting patterns for typical groups that show up in organic compounds. This is reminiscent of the isopropyl group, right? We've got a septet, and we'll roll back to our spectrum and verify that's a septet here in a second. And we've got a doublet, and we've got a relative integration of one to six in our spectrum. We just have that twice, suggesting two isopropyl groups. In fact, I'm going to copy this because this is very likely a fragment that shows up in our compound of interest here in this problem. And it is very likely that these 12 hydrogens are associated with the CH3 groups in two isopropyl groups. Why not copy this twice, right? And it's likely that these two hydrogens at the downfield or deshielded signal are due to the two methine protons in two isopropyl groups. Okay, very interesting. Now let's take stock of what we've accounted for here in terms of the molecular formula. The isopropyl group contains three carbons, the two methyl carbons and the methine carbon here, and so we've only accounted for six carbons total so far, but the molecular formula has seven carbons. We also haven't accounted for any unsaturation yet, right? These are all single bonds in these structures. Finally, it's worth noting that we want to account somehow for this chemical shift. This chemical shift uh, that looks to be about 2.75, that's pretty deshielded. That suggests an electronegative functional group, something to do with this oxygen in the vicinity of these carbons. So one idea we might have, for instance, is to link up the isopropyl groups via an oxygen like this, creating diisopropyl ether. The problem here is this doesn't match the molecular formula. It's only got six carbons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. It's not C7. So we can rule that out. But what we can do, and more generally, and when we get to full structural elucidation in the next unit, we'll see how this works. At this point, we would go to the infrared spectrum and we would see a gorgeous carbonyl stretch in the infrared spectrum between, uh, say, 1600 and 1750 or 1600 and 1800 wave numbers and that's going to indicate the presence of a carbonyl group in this compound. Now as it stands right here there's no direct evidence of a carbonyl group in the NMR spectrum except for the fact that this signal shows up around 2.75 ppm which is typical for a carbon that is adjacent to a carbonyl group. So these two fragments are connected to each other. In fact, the two isopropyl groups are both connected to the central carbonyl carbon. So now we've got three fragments, and all we have to do is assemble these into the overall molecular structure. And here, that's going to involve having the carbonyl group at the center. We're going to have one isopropyl group on one side and the other isopropyl group on the other side. And let's verify that this does fit all the data we have. First thing, it needs to fit the molecular formula. How many carbons do we have? Well, we have the six carbons of the two isopropyl groups, and we have the central carbonyl carbon, seven carbons. Good to go. We have one oxygen. We're good to go there. How many hydrogens do we have? Well, I have seven on this side, seven in this isopropyl group, and I have seven in this isopropyl group. Here's that last one. So I've got a total of 14 hydrogens, and degrees of unsaturation also point to this, right? Because I have one double bond. Notice my unsaturation is right here. That one degree of unsaturation is accounted for in the carbonyl group. 
So I'm consistent with the molecular formula, and I'm also consistent in terms of connectivity, splitting patterns, and chemical shift. There are our red protons, and here are our blue protons. So there we go. This is diisopropyl ketone, classic isopropyl containing organic compound. This next one's quite a bit harder. We now see four distinct signals in the NMR spectrum. Really, before diving into the proton NMR, I want to look at the HDI based on the formula here, and it's going to be quite a bit higher than the last example. So C9 would be H20 when fully saturated, right? 2 times 9 plus 2 is 20. We've got 10 hydrogens in the molecular formula, and the oxygen has no effect. And so we have 5 degrees of unsaturation, or an HDI of 5, in this compound. Now with an HDI that high, we're going to have potentially a lot of rings, or a lot of double bonds, or a lot of, a lot of both in the structure. And whenever the HDI is equal to or greater than 4, I'm always thinking about an aromatic ring. Notice that a benzene ring accounts for four degrees of unsaturation in and of itself. I have three double bonds and one ring in the structure. So the HDI of benzene itself is equal to four. And substituted benzenes will also have this same HDI. So it's likely in this compound that we have a benzene ring with some additional stuff, right, to um, account for the other carbons and, and that kind of thing. I'm just going to kind of pull this off to the side because maybe there's a benzene ring, maybe there's not. Maybe this whole thought process is a dead end. I'm going to keep that in my back pocket until I can use it later, and if I end up not being able to use it, that's okay. We might end up, for example, with a triple bond or a couple of triple bonds or triple bonds and rings or many, many rings in the structure, depending on other circumstances. So. Now, let's take a look at the integrations. The smallest integration is, is basically 14, right? And so I'm going to divide all of these by 14. And what I end up with in terms of the smallest ratios based on these integrations is this is about 1, this is 1.5, this comes out to 1, and this comes out to 1.5. And if we do the usual dance of totaling all this up, this comes out to only five hydrogens accounted for. And of course, a number of hydrogens can't be a decimal value. And so we might as well scale all these up by two, right? Scale this up to, we'll call this two, we'll call this three, this two, and this three. And now this corresponds to the actual number of hydrogens associated with each signal. So I've got a 2H and a 3H, and I've got a 2H here, and a 3H here. All right, excellent. What now? What now indeed? Well, now we can dig into either chemical shift or the coupling, the splitting patterns. Actually, I want to touch on the splitting pattern first because the first thing that jumps out to me is this pattern of signals. I have a quartet that integrates to 2, and a triplet that integrates to 3. Notice, this 3H has two neighbors, as implied by its triplet. This 2H has three neighbors, as implied by its quartet. And so these two signals go together. And if we had coupling constants, we, would, we could verify this. The spacing between these subpeaks is identical between these two sets of, of um, peaks. So this suggests that these are connected to each other. And the chemical shifts suggest that we're looking at an ethyl group here. If we again roll back to our common structures found in organic molecules and their typical splitting patterns, we have the classic D-shielded 2H signal that's a quartet, shielded 3H signal that's a triplet. That corresponds to an ethyl group. So let's copy this and grab it because it is very likely a fragment that's in our compound of interest. Okay, so that's going to show up in our structure most likely, and we have accounted for these guys, these 2H, and we've accounted for these 3H here. All right, we've also accounted for two more carbons which is quite important, right? Because we are now, if we're, if we're keeping the benzene ring involved. And let's go ahead and, and grab this and pull it over here to our sort of fragment list. If we're thinking of the benzene ring as involved here, we've now accounted for eight carbons. 
it appears. We've accounted for eight carbons here. And it's likely that this benzene ring is going to be connected to something else. It's a fragment, right? It's not going to be there by itself. It's going to have to be connected to other things. Now, how do we really know that there's a benzene ring there? Well, this benzene ring has hydrogens. How many hydrogens are there in this benzene fragment? Well, we have one bond to something else. This leaves the other five carbons of the benzene ring bearing hydrogens. So I should expect five hydrogens in the aromatic region of the proton NMR spectrum. And I'm actually going to jump over to a proton NMR correlation chart to show you where CH protons typically show up. It's roughly speaking between six and a half and eight and a half ppm. It's typical of aromatic protons, protons connected to benzene rings and related aromatic structures. Let's see if we have that in our particular spectrum. In fact, we do. Not only do we have two signals in the right chemical shift range between 7 and 8 ppm, the total integration here is 5, which is perfectly consistent with what we'd expect for a phenyl ring or a benzene ring. These five hydrogens are all showing up in this aromatic region of the spectrum. The coupling is a mess due to long-range coupling effects, which we touched on when we talked about coupling constants a little while back. Don't worry too much about the splitting patterns here. They're a mess because of long-range coupling, but the chemical shift is sufficient evidence here to conclude we've got a benzene ring in the structure. So we've accounted for eight carbons. We've accounted for four degrees of unsaturation. We've, we're still missing a carbon, and we haven't accounted for the oxygen. But again, based on the chemical shift, of this signal right here, the ethyl signal in particular, and the relatively de-shielded aromatic signals, particularly the 2H that are close to 8 ppm, both of these are reminiscent of a very electronegative and electron withdrawing carbonyl group in the structure. This accounts for our missing carbon, accounts for that missing degree of unsaturation, and I think given the prevalence of evidence is the most likely fragment that we're missing here is a CO double bond. And again, how would we do this in real life or in structure elucidation problems? We'd go to the infrared spectrum and look for that classic carbon yield stretching uh, peak around 1700 wave numbers. So we have the benzene ring or the phenyl ring connected to the carbonyl group, and we have the ethyl group here. Don't forget to add those double bonds to the benzene ring. And now let's do a sanity check. Is this consistent with the molecular formula? Well, as a shortcut, it's got how many degrees of unsaturation? One, two, three, four due to the ring, and five due to the carbonyl group. That does match our HDI in the molecular formula. It does have nine carbons, six due to the benzene ring, one due to the carbonyl, and two due to the ethyl group. Six plus one plus two is nine. And based on the HDI determination, it must have 10 hydrogens, and of course, it has one oxygen as well. So fits the molecular formula. We have the quartet triplet ethyl group splitting pattern right here, and we have five protons in the aromatic region of the spectrum, which is consistent with the phenyl ring. So there we go. This is ethyl phenyl ketone.